Camp Harbor View was an idea first conceived by Mayor Tom Menino in 2006 as an oasis for hundreds of city kids in the summer, many of whom live just a mile away but have never seen Boston Harbor. Joining me now is the man who helped make that dream a reality, Jack Connors, Hill Holiday founder, one of Boston's most prominent businessmen. You are, right? Yeah, you are. A legend of my own. Along with the president of the Camp Harbor View Foundation, Sharon McNally. Sharon, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. When Menino called you on the phone and says, I have an idea, I need your help, what did he say? Well, how did he sell you? You're the salesman. How did he sell you? <laughs> he said, uh, it was like sending out the bat signal, you know. He said, <laughs> you got to get down to Gotham City right away. I got a problem. He, uh, he talked about his concern about kids in the neighborhoods of the city, uh, in some cases dodging bullets, in some cases being held in their apartments until their parents got home. That's not a way to have a summer. And he wanted to deal with that, and he, so he called me down. Okay, so he called it a little piece of heaven more than once. Who are these kids? How many kids? Who are these kids who come there? They're kids from the inner city. They're kids from the neighborhoods. They're, they're mostly from Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, Hyde Park, those areas. They're just regular kids who want to have some fun, want to be safe, want to have a normal summer. And what do they do when they're there? What do they do? I actually, Tom and Nina was kind enough to take me out there one day, and I got to meet a lot of these kids, virtually every one of whom knew him from their community, which was surreal. Yeah. Uh, what do they do when they're there? They swim, they sail, they play tennis, they play basketball, they go to analogous power classes, they ride bikes for the first time. Some of them had never ridden a two-wheeler. It's not all they learned. do. I want to do it. Here's a quote from a 14-year-old kid from JP in the Globe recently. We're going to pop it up in a minute. He says, it's like family here. You don't have to worry about people hating you. You can just communicate and talk things out. I have to say, when I went there, I thought this was totally BS rhetoric. <laughs> and then I saw some of the staff people pulling kids aside who were about to have a fight and explaining to them how to resolve disputes without punching somebody or shooting somebody. That works there, does it not? It does, and the kids really kind of leave their armor behind. Literally, know? in they, some yeah, cases. Yeah. But it's just a... It's a place to be safe and to be happy and, in a lot of cases, to learn. How do you keep this afloat, again, horrible choice of words, <laughs> with no bridge? I'm serious. How would you do this? Well, uh, the good news is when they condemned the bridge, we had eight months to uh, figure <laughs> out what we're going to do. Yeah. You know? uh, and so we needed every day of those eight months. We really ready. did. And the, uh, it's just a, a tribute to the folks in the city, really, in the, in the community. But what would you do? You have furries? How are you doing this? So we raised a bundle of money and we chartered two ferries. One to uh, pick up most of the kids in the morning, uh, and the second to pick up the straggling buses who don't quite get there <laughs> on time because of traffic. But uh, so far, so good. And the kids, camp starts when they get on the ferry. They start singing camp songs, they have breakfast, and then on the way back, they're singing and eating as well. When people give you mountains of money, and I know yeah. they have, yeah. I mean, this, do they give because you're asking or because they actually care about these kids? We believe they give because they, they believe in the mission. Uh -huh. I mean, the, it's, it's got a little notoriety now. It's got a little awareness, and people think it works. But Speaking that's of modest. I'm sorry. I just have to interrupt. That's sure. modest. I think originally they gave because it was Jack asking, because they knew if Jack was behind it, it had to be something good. And now I think they understand the mission. And do, you so track, do you track these kids? I mean, do you know that we're a kid from the, I don't mean every single one of them, a kid who was there in year one. How is he or she doing, and a what lot, did this do in their life? A lot of them came in year one. They, they were campers for three years, and they became LITs, and now they're staff. And some of them are going to college. So we have 44 kids now on scholarships from Camp Harbor View who were starting with us as campers. So we do keep a pretty good track of them, and we know that their lives are better because of camp. And you're saying, which I wasn't aware of, so some of the kids who are campers as young kids come back and are yeah. counselors and yes. sort of they've done it, they've been there, and they do that, that kind of thing. And uh, the camp is a four-week experience, 450 kids in July, 450 in August. But uh, we're there year-round with their families. There's support groups, there's holiday parties, there's all kinds of tutorial programs. And as Sharon said, uh, we've got 44 kids going to college on scholarships from Camp Harborview. You do this not just because you care about the kids, you do it because you cared about Menino. Is that not a fair to keep one of his most there's, important? There's no question about it. And this year uh, was pretty special because this is the first year, first, this is right. season nine, the first year we haven't had uh, my partner and really the inspiration for the whole thing. So uh, when we went out to raise money, we were wondering, are we going to be as successful as in the past? We blew by every record we ever had. We raised at the gala. We raised $5.5 uh, $5 million. What's one zero, Jack, yeah, yeah. amongst friends? $5.5 yeah. $5 million. That's but what's interesting, we had a sponsor of the camper program that Sharon packaged a number of, sponsored 10 campers, yeah. sponsored five, 
raised nine hundred thousand dollars to sponsor a camper. If people, yeah. what's the web address if people want to know, or how can they get in touch, learn things, that sort of thing? www.chvf.com. You sure about that? .org. I know you are. Chv.org. <laughs> that always stumps everybody. It does. You know, in light of the fact that you're the guy that can fix everything, isn't that essentially what his mo is? That he can mm -hmm. fix. Okay. Can we talk about one of the things you're trying to fix? You were, I let me guess, a strategic advisor to Boston 2024. Yeah. I read in the Globe you're going to help them emerge from early controversy. Are they emerging with your help? Well, I suppose the good news is that they are emerging. Uh, it's now really in the hands of the electeds. Uh, the mayor and the governor will decide whether this is appropriate, whether it's right, and they're, they're the folks that uh, people chose to represent them. They'll make the right decision. But Jack, you are the salesman extraordinary, and I mean that as praise, yeah. not, not yeah. Uh, in a critical way. Thank you. If someone, you stop someone on the street and someone says, you, uh, Mr. Connors, uh, $4 billion of private investment, yeah. we don't know who that is. Huge insurance policies, nobody's been identified. No velodrome, no aquatics, no press area. On, on. All what, sounds how, pretty potentially wonderful. I'm serious. How do you explain to that person that they should trust that this is something that they should vote for and support? I'm not asking anybody to trust yet. I'm asking them to do what Ronald Reagan asked them to do, trust but verify. We're still fleshing out the numbers. I have to say that even though John Fish and uh, Steve Also Pat involved in Camp Harbor Review, we should right. say John Fish. Built the yeah. play. Yeah. Uh, but between John Fish and uh, Steve Pagliuca, these are guys that have been treated like a couple of pinatas and everybody's got a stick. The fact is they stepped in and brought some ideas and some leadership. So we'll see. I mean, we're not uh, soji. Uh, this is not critical to our, uh, our economy. But uh, it's a good idea that deserves uh, a conversation. That's what's going on right now. And the, the right people make the right decision. I'm going to support whatever decision they make. Fair enough. Well, that's controversial. Camp Harbor View is not. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you, Thank you very much. There. Really Jack, appreciate the It's good the to see you. To and Sharon, it's great Jim, to see you too. Lots of luck with Thank it. Thank you very the much. Ta a time for tomorrow's Globe tonight. It's your first look at Wednesday morning's Boston Globe as I settle my chair with city editor Stephen Smith. And as always, we remind you, we are taping at 5.30. Hello, Steve. What's Hello on there, page Jim. one? How are you there? 15 countries, four continents. That was the travel itinerary of Deval Patrick as governor when he went on trade missions. So what exactly did taxpayers get for their money? The answer isn't entirely clear. In some cases, proposed business deals fizzled. But there is also evidence to suggest that the governor's trips planted the seeds for direct flights from China and Israel to Boston. And one venture capitalist who traveled with the governor said the contacts he made on those trips easily eclipsed the $1.5 million that the state spent underwriting the travel. So he says it was a good deal. Well, very quickly, and I don't mean this is either an endorsement or a, a trashing of the thing. Doesn't every governor do this for better or worse? It's interesting. Bill Weld and Paul Salucci did. Mitt Romney uh, did not. And the Baker administration says it has no plans imminently, but that it might be open to it. What else is on that front page tomorrow, Steve? So it was dubbed Kimono Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. uh, curators at the Museum of Fine Arts thought that it would be a way to connect a Claude Monet 19th century painting directly with museum goers by letting those patrons try on kimonos on Wednesday. But that event has drawn a raft of criticism both at the museum and online. Protesters saying that the event evinced a, a degree of racial insensitivity and perpetuated stereotypes. After initially saying that the Kimono Wednesday event would continue, the MFA has now canceled it and apologized. Change its policy and also change its director. Steve Smith, great to see you. See you again tomorrow, as always. So when Dylan Roof was arraigned last month for the killing of nine parishioners in Charleston, the hearing was noteworthy not just for the forgiveness offered the shooter by victims' families, but by something Charleston County Magistrate James Skip Gosnell Jr. said as well. We have victims, nine of them. But we also have victims on the other side. We must find it in our heart at some point in time, not only to help those that are victims, but to also help his family as well. Obviously, the mass murderer's sister took those words to heart. Here is the GoFundMe page she created for her wedding, originally set for four days after the massacre. 
It was titled A Fresh Start for Amber and Michael. The Charleston massacre took place and our lives were forever changed. The media abused our privacy and published all of our wedding information and destroyed our dream day, destroying the first day of Michael and my life together. Destroyed their day? Changed their lives forever? When I first read this, I checked to be sure it was not a spoof on The Onion. It wasn't. Amber Roof said her goal was to raise 5,000 bucks to cover, quote, lost wedding costs, to pay bills, and to send us on our dream honeymoon. Well, before pulling the site down, 39 people donated $1,639 for that dream honeymoon. You know, some stories need comment. This one doesn't, at least for me. But do you have a reaction that I can actually read on the air? Email us, tweet us, find us online, share your thoughts. Now, we again received a good deal of feedback on my wardrobe. And if you missed what I wore last night, here it is. It was a light gray suit, which I thought was actually quite nice given the season and the weather, but some disciples of Mr. Blackwell had other thoughts. Tony wrote, all you're missing is a stethoscope around your neck. Chris chimed in with game show host, and David asked, where did you park your ice cream truck? Thank you all. Speaking of the outfit, it may have had an impact on my interview last night with Bob DeSalvio. He's the president of Win Everett. How does the su casino succeed when the guy who runs the big city next door calls the process which led to the selection, quote, corrupt, and says that your people misled him and are misleading the people of Massachusetts? How do you ever reconcile that? Oh, I think it can be re rectified quite easily. Quite easily. Well, what Bob failed to tell me is that Wynn Resorts yesterday threatened to sue Mayor Walsh unless he apologizes for the comments he's made about the casino plant. I was puzzled why Bob didn't just say that when I asked that question, but then I got this tweet from Sheila. Here it is. She wrote that Bob's omission was perhaps due to his awe of my inspiring suit slash tie choice. And as you can see, she added the hashtag, just say yes to hot weather threats. Thank you, Sheila. Now it all makes sense. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow. What do you think of the jacket? He's pro metric system and studied specialized horseshoe making, among other disciplines. Republican turned independent, turned Democrat, the former governor of Rhode Island, Lincoln Chafee will be here. Plus, we'll explore some of the strange bedfellows the anti-Olympics efforts are bringing out from the United Independent Party and the gas tax repeal group to Black Lives Matter and Occupy. That and more tomorrow at seven, right here in Greater Boston. I hope you'll join me. Have a good night.